question is really difficult, and you see it, you see it during the forum, you see it also during the organization of the forum. Um, yeah, what I think is really necessary to create an open space, uh, an open platform for everyone to participate and for everyone to to join and to let themselves be heard. So I think it's really, really important and crucial for a social movement, for yeah, for an autre monde qui est possible, uh, to have an open space to respect each other's differences and to react on those differences and say, hey, you're not like me, you probably think otherwise than I do. What do you think of this? How would you do? What would you do? And that's really important and I think in the world, especially, that's not been done enough. Well, uh, I came for the social forum one month before the start of the social forum to help to volunteer. And me and my friend, we went to the, the headquarters of the organization and we asked for, hey, we're here a month before and we want to really want to help, we're really motivated, we have the energy and we have the well, social spirit, so to speak. And, well, they said it's, it, it's really difficult to, well, to also come across some kind of cultural barrier, which, I, which of course exists and it's really difficult to come across. And, to really help and put some steps and we didn't really get into the heart of the organization we really didn't get into steps we can do we didn't get responsibilities or crucial tasks to do the only thing we, we got was uh, fill in some papers and work them out on a computer and that was all and that's really difficult I have we also were a little uh, well, modest in how to uh, and shy how, how to react and not be too aggressive asking what we can do and how we could do it because well there's also some kind of neo-colonial uh, aspect to it so that's why we were modest to not to impose our ideas so to speak uh, but still how can we, we say how can we critique um, I don't want to backstab or say how it is, because in the end there is a forum and the forum is, I came to the conclusion, the forum is not made by some kind of organization, the forum is made by the participants who come and the people who make the activities. And a lot of people from all over the world, and not only Senegal or Europe or North America, come here to make um, uh, activities and organize them, but a lot of people come here and they show what uh, what they are thinking and how they think and what's possible in the domain they are interested in and they are specialized in. And that is what I think the social forum has been made of. The people who come and the people who participate and who make this a social movement where the capitalist world is really afraid of and it should be. Thank you. That's good. Il y a beaucoup de moyens d'ailleurs ici. Even 
when you have the land, the system and the governing system, do not make sure that those people with land, I'm one of the, I think of myself as one of the last generation of people who grew up on a land, piece of land, went to school from uh, selling vegetables from a three acre piece of land, looking after cattle and goats, and that was our wealth. We didn't think of ourselves as poor because some people are uh, somewhere in Wisconsin or London or Oxford or Harvard University thought we were poor because we didn't have two dollars a day. Uh, but that is what has been lost, that imagination of a different way of organizing the economy. Long time no see. Well, the old I give him, the old I give him 70,000. I give him, I give him 60,000. In a situation whereby we are in, in two big, uh, we are in between two big giants, the government and the multinationals, and these guys are actually sleeping in the same bed, and we are just civil society. But I always believe as civil society, we are powerful, we are strong. The multinationals, they, have, they, they, they can have the all, they, they can have dollars in the world, the, 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 the government, they can have all the powers. But I believe as civil society, we are much, much stronger. So we as NGOs, we as civil society, we as the um, civil movement, we actually need to, 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 to ensure that we actually build the unity. The first one is uh, the challenge that we have for knowledge production and the fact that homophobia in Africa is so fashionable that people writing about us are from Harvard, from Yale, from York, from everything. I mean, uh, I really have a big respect for academia and the type of, uh, I find it very useful in relation to what academia offers us. But at the same time, I'm uh, equally critical of how also, especially from those uh, northern-based universities, how they understand uh, homosexuality in Africa and homosexuals or such things better than, you know, we can even articulate or even attempt to find our own language and so on. There is so much. I don't think that any one of us who even organized this event can think to have such a broad view on what is happening even inside this continent. Uh, there is so much we need to learn. As a South African, I don't know much even about Southern Africa. I don't know much about East Africa or the one. I don't know much about North. I don't know much about what's happening in the Arab Africa versus of There is so much we need to know. No one can be a voice of the true struggles that are happening in Africa. We can't, no one should even pretend to attempt that. It, will, it, it is true that it will never be enough to only struggle as a lesbian, you know, because of the multiplicity of identities and the multiplicities of struggles and crises and horrible manifestations that inform how we live our daily life. But equally, uh, I, 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 I have recognized the importance of even in my organization that is very lesbian and gay, to say for instance, what are the challenges that, that are linked to being lesbian and gay, but that have to do with the multiplicity of crises that are going on in the continent and in the world, that actually can optimize the way we see the world, the way we, the way we struggle against this, against the destruction of the environment and so on. Uh. But I also think that we can learn 
from other movements as well. Um, you know, the global ecological movement has done some creative things. Um, you have city councils declaring their fair trade towns. Uh, you have town councils taking resolutions that they are transition towns, etc., etc. Now, I, 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 I can't. I, I don't know why we can't push for a similar approach uh, against homophobia, where we get. Uh, you know, local spaces to declare that these are not homophobic spaces uh, publicly as part of campaigning and so on and creating liberated uh, spaces for sexualities of all sorts to prevail. But and I think that is the challenge of saying this struggle against capitalism is a struggle that affects all of us and uh, be able to achieve the one of building this movement and the one of building that movement but never seeing them uh, as opposition, but more seeing them as reinforcing the broad views and the broad visions of that other world that I use advisedly that we want to 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 be living in. on Africa, Africa in crisis and Africa in struggle, so that we create greater understanding of uh, the voices of struggle and the challenges in Africa, so that it's not just statistics, you know, Africa is the poorest continent and Africa has got big malaria and big HIV and AIDS, but um, to locate Africa within um, the global context of ongoing underdevelopment and how um, we are still struggling to rebuild Africa after years of colonialization and post-colonialism and neoliberalism and so on. Yeah. Um, the, the crisis in Africa is there's a multiple crisis, like in many parts of the world. But we think here, it's in our continent, it's particular. Um, I think people tend to forget that in some parts of Africa, colonialism only ended recently. And in some cases, uh, 50 years ago. And when the colonizers left, um, 
they didn't leave a lot of infrastructure, they didn't leave a lot of resources, they left men a legacy, a legacy that was um, a legacy that destroyed much of Africa. And they also left a legacy that created unequal relationships between Africa. If I look at Senegal, um, the Senegalese look to France to solve their problems. And that unequal relationship, it's a very bad relationship that continues. The exploitation of the natural resources, of the wealth, of everything continues in a different form with the colonizers in different ways and so when we talk about Africa in crisis we trying to look at all of those things all right and we have new challenges in recent years as the global crisis deepens the food crisis or the energy crisis Africa continues to be exploited. If I look at uh, some of the agreements that come from um, Copenhagen where there is carbon trading, then it's the North saying to the South, um, if you, we will um, pay you to use some of your carbon, you know. So it's again a nature, uh, an exploitative relationship that con it goes on and on and on like that. So if I look at land grabs, who are the people grabbing land in this continent? So that's some of it. But most importantly, there is a political crisis, a crisis of dictatorships, a crisis of despotism, a crisis of corruption, a whole range of things. And I think some of those crises of corruption and, and so on, the political crisis that we see is very related to the fact that in much of poor countries it is the means of accumulation, accumulation to gather money, to gather wealth, it is through the state. So the elites need the state to accumulate its capital. So. It's an ongoing vicious cycle of, of underdevelopment and corruption and so on and so on. And so I am very pleased that um, we don't only talk about the crisis that I've just described, uh, but we also talk about the fact that we uh, um, there is a lot of resistance and a lot of fight back and people are very resilient. If you look and you drive through the streets here, Every day I walk in the university and I look at the hostels. Ugh. Then I think to myself, this is, a, this is a ghetto. How can people learn in this ghetto? And I cannot understand that the youth have not revolted against the appalling conditions that they have to live under. So it's, it's some of the stuff I... I um, I am uh, shocked at what we see. Yeah, uh, the conference is in Africa. It's in Senegal, and this was the moment. We are at a particular moment uh, in Africa where we see um, lots and lots of struggles from below, where in different ways um, repressive regimes are being challenged. Um, Ivory Coast, uh, Tunisia, um, Egypt, these are just some examples of, of, of it. And we think that the conference, this World Social Forum, should have given, placed Egypt, Tunisia and solidarity with those struggles in the center of the World Social Forum. I hope they still do it today. We've worked on our statement and we will insert it in the uh, social movement assemblies and so on. But it's also a moment that um, 
we've used for African networks and movements to unite and find common strategy. Whether it is the COP17, whether it is us as rural women talking about seeds and what we are going to do, all of these linkages must be strengthened. We must find the ways and the resources for people to build um, tighter linkages, etc. Yeah. So, I think we have to discuss the future of the World Social Forum. Can we leave the space so open? Can it be everything to everybody? Or must we begin to say that we need to radicalize the process? I believe we should radicalize it. We must be more militant about change. This is an opportunity for people coming from all parts. And we must say, um, we want change. We want uh, a different, we must uh, condemn what's going on in the Africa Union or in the G20 and really uh, increase our capacity to fight, strengthen the alternative movements. Yeah, that's what I think should happen. There's a lot of new initiatives taking place, lots of new political initiatives also. I think the Tunisian example was a wonderful example of how people are beginning to take over their own. It's not easy, but people are organizing everywhere. Uh, people are using social media, the youth are getting organized, and people are saying enough is enough. Um, I think we must also begin to build linkages and solidarity with, like we did during apartheid times, with the North, where people can say, um, it's a student movement, the German students must say, we want solidarity with the Egyptian students, or, you know, like that. We must really make the linkages and say that we are the agents of change. Nobody's going to change our world except us. So some of those things I think I'm very optimistic about. Wer bist du denn überhaupt? Ja, also ich bin Felicia, komme aus Deutschland und bin hier mit der Karalane Afrik Group Interact. Ähm, und wir sind äh, leider hierher geflogen. Ich wäre gerne auf dem Landweg gefahren, aber auf dem Hinflug haben wir schon direkt eine Abschiebung verhindern können. Das war sehr aufregend, ähm, aber es war erfolgreich. Und dann sind wir von Bamako nach Dakar mit einer Karawane gefahren mit äh, 500 Leuten. Wir haben zwischendurch Zwischenstopps gemacht, wo wir Demos gemacht haben, Aktionen gemacht haben, Frauentreffen gemacht haben, uns versucht haben zu vernetzen auf basisaktivistischer Ebene. Und jetzt sind wir hier in Dakar auf dem Weltsozialforum. Okay, warum seid ihr hergekommen? Warum macht ihr das alles? Also eigentlich ist uns das Weltsozialforum gar nicht so wichtig. Uns war eigentlich die Vernetzung viel wichtiger, also der Weg hierher, um mit äh, Aktivistinnen, in Kontakt zu kommen, um eine längere äh, Zusammenarbeit zu ermöglichen, also um den Kampf zu, gemeinsam zu gestalten. Okay, wir waren ja jetzt hier gerade auf einer kleinen Demo. Magst du kurz erklären, warum, was das Ziel der Demo war und warum wir die gemacht haben? Ja, hier in Dakar befinden wir uns gerade direkt neben dem äh, Frontex-Büro und äh, wir äh, kämpfen für Bewegungsfreiheit und da ist natürlich Frontex äh, ein sehr willkommenes äh, Ziel bzw. ein sehr willkommener Gegner. Die äh, sind mittlerweile, äh, kümmern die sich auch um, die Gren um den Grenzschutz hier innerhalb von Afrika und da sind wir natürlich sehr dagegen, weil wir für offene Grenzen kämpfen. Okay. Und Frontex ist verantwortlich für viele Tote auf dem Weg nach Europa. Okay, dann vielen Dank für das Interview Gerne. und viel Spaß noch hier. <lacht> Solidarity, 
c'est que j'aime bien, c'est la solidarité. Solidarité, solidarité, solidarité. Solidarité, solidarité, solidarité. Nous nous battons pour un monde sans frontières. Merci. Je suis paysan, je ne suis pas dans une ONG comme fonctionnaire, comme, mais je suis agriculteur. Et donc, je suis quelqu'un qui, qui travaille sur les questions agricoles avec les autres paysans, pour l'idée de défendre la cause des paysans, défendre aussi euh, aujourd'hui la question des militants migrants, parce que l'agriculture aujourd'hui est liée à la migration. Pas d'abord migration pour aller en Europe, mais migration à l'intérieur. Pourquoi Parce que les agriculteurs vivent très mal. Souvent, il n'y a pas de route pour les agriculteurs. Il n'y a pas de les hôpitaux, il n'y a pas de bonnes écoles. Et les prix sont souvent des prix très bas. Donc, quand vous vendez des produits, vous ne pouvez pas vivre avec votre agriculture. Bon. Il y a des choses, parce qu'il y a beaucoup plus de produits importés qui viennent, des produits qui viennent de l'Europe, qui viennent dans le, sur le marché. Et donc, les, souvent, les agriculteurs quittent leur village pour la ville. C'est l'exode rural, c'est le point de départ de la migration. Et de la ville, ils arrivent en ville, il n'y a pas d'emploi, il n'y a pas de travail. Donc, ils vont chercher aussi à quitter la ville pour aller ailleurs, dans un autre pays. Donc, c'est la migration. C'est comme les pêcheurs. Il a besoin de prendre le gros poisson. Mais le gros poisson, c'est le ministre, c'est le président. Quand il vole, on ne peut pas le pêcher. Il sort du filet. Mais c'est le petit voleur qu'on arrête. Mais les grands voleurs, les gros poissons, comme le ministre, on ne les arrête pas. Alors, à quoi sert la justice quand on n'arrête pas le gros poisson Alors qu'on a la Convention des Nations Unies contre la corruption. Et donc, dans le monde, avec cette convention, on peut lutter contre la corruption. My name is Omar Bendera, I am from Algeria and I work for the Fondation France Fanon, France Fanon Foundation, which is temporarily based in Paris. Okay, and uh, why are you here at the World Social Forum? We are here as a foundation, I, as a member of the foundation, I am here to, uh, to join all these people that are coming from around the world to try to invent a new world, a new order of justice and peace and, uh, between the peoples of the, the planet. And uh, we think that uh, Franz Fanon, who was one of the great thinkers of the Algerian revolution, of the uh, African revolution, uh, can be uh, re-read uh, through the events that we are now uh, going through. The, ba the basis of, the, uh, of the Fanon's analysis is the is uh, to be found into the concept of domination and uh, the concept of emancipation. How can we go from this domination status that is ours to emancipation, to freedom? How can we get from uh, a, a posture or an attitude of a colonized people to a liberated one? I think that this is absolutely actual. The domination has changed, it is not the same. We have no colonizers here in Africa. But we have something different, but which is based on the same patterns of exploitation and domination. And uh, this is why we think that Fano and his analysis are still uh, actual and pertinent. How can we fight against racism? Uh, we, have, we have to fight against... Uh, racism is, uh, is part of the culture of the capitalism. So we have to fight this uh, liberalism and to uh, open up the mind of the people and uh, in saying that the permanence of uh, <coughs> the capitalist exploitation and this 
market religion is uh, probably the cause of all the troubles we are facing. en Afrique. Nous sommes dans un continent très pauvre et nous savons tous que les conditions ne sont pas assez réunies pour les Africains de pouvoir s'améliorer. Souvent nous dépendons des Européens pour pouvoir continuer, mais est-ce qu'on peut toujours compter sur quelqu'un d'autre Il y a un proverbe qui dit que, par exemple, quelqu'un qui vient à sa fois dire « Mais ma gueule, offre-moi du poisson, offre-moi du poisson ». Mieux vaut l'apprendre à pêcher que les nobles savent de poisson. Les Africains doivent prendre par eux-mêmes leur propre responsabilité au lieu de compter sur les, sur les Européens. Parce que les Européens, ils ne présentent pas, je veux dire, ce n'est pas pour leur vexer ou bien pour vexer, mais chaque personne tient compte de ses intérêts personnels. Et c'est ces intérêts personnels qui le font avancer. Les Européens ils tiennent compte de leurs intérêts, intérêts personnels. Et si les Africains pensent que les Européens vont tous les aider, non. Ça montre si ne fonctionne plus ainsi. who have captured power in all the state houses around the world. And we must not be allowed to be used as guinea pigs by biotech industry who are trying to push genetically engineered food into Africa. Africa does not need a green revolution on the basis of genetic engineering. Sounds like a strange topic. In fact, it's it's, it's those of us um, around here, they're around my age. I guess Rio Plus 20 makes some sense. It's you can understand what the Earth Summit of 20 years ago. This is not now 20 years later um, another Earth Summit. It's really an Earth grab. It's really a proposal being presented, which will be on the tables and negotiate over the next few months, leading up to the head of state meeting next year that is trying to entrench a new kind of, not just a land grab again, but an earth grab. The second goal they have for Real Plus 20 is to launch what they call the green economies. And Nemo talked about that, the idea, the greenwash ideas uh, of how suddenly there's a new set of technologies, a new suite of solutions that will solve our problems for us. Their hope is that the world will buy their idea that this is green, it's got to be good, right? Green is good, it's got to be right, we've got to accept these new green economies. But we're all in favor of green economies, but what they're proposing is not quite what we're expecting. They're proposing strategies which are quite different from anything we'd ever hear about or talk about in the World Social Forum. Effectively, there are three green economies, or three green technologies they're putting on the table for us to consider. The third technology that will be proposed, and is being proposed now and discussed now, in the United States Congress and in the UK Parliament, for example, is perhaps more shocking than that. It's called geoengineering. Not genetic engineering, geoengineering. 
And geoengineering is this theory, which is of course quite realistic, that after all, hey, you know, we, we kind of geoengineered the planet into climate change, into the crisis that we're in today. Therefore, the companies that caused the problem can now geoengineer us out of the problem. And it's theoretically possible to just tweak the planet a bit, just tweak planetary systems a little bit so that we can reduce the amount of sunlight that hits the Earth, or we can absorb carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the ocean. There's ways that can be done. We now have patents being granted, we now have money being spent, we now have the National Academy of Sciences in the United States and the Royal Society in the United Kingdom with documents and proposals on how they will go about doing that. How it may be possible to blast uh, sulfates into the stratosphere to block sunlight as a kind of an artificial volcano. So you can dim down the sun just a fraction, have very nice sunsets and sunrises, and you will lower temperatures by one or two degrees. And that will buy time for other things. Or it's possible to, again, put nanoparticles of iron on the surface of the ocean in areas where there's a, de a deficit in, in iron nutrients, put it there, create a phytoplankton bloom, which will then absorb carbon dioxide and sink to the bottom of the ocean. So again, it's an issue that's, that is actually lively and on the table. It's not science fiction. Or yes, no, I'll take that back. It is science fiction. But they are talking about doing it. The logic is overwhelming. It makes sense. Because, after all, they haven't done anything about climate change so far. This is the solution for a, com a government that wants to get reelected or an industry that doesn't want to change. And all they have to say is, don't worry, we have a technological fix that will solve the problem. We don't need to change our lifestyles. We don't need to do anything else. All we've got to do is let industry change the planet. Then everything will be okay. We've done it before, we can do it again. But what's especially attractive about it is that you don't need to have the United Nations agree to it. Because a handful of countries, a handful of billionaires, can do it by themselves. It's not that expensive. You can get, and this, this term has been used, a coalition of the willing can be brave enough to come together and do it themselves on behalf of the rest of the planet, if we want them to do that. And that's the conversation that's, that's taking place. That's the kind of issue that's at stake at Rio Plus 20. That's the kind of stuff we've got to be concerned about and challenging over the next few months. This can't just be some quick pass through by government leaders who are going to say, we've got a green economy now so you can relax, don't worry, be happy. We've got these solutions, synthetic biology or nanotechnology or geoengineering, you don't have to change your lifestyle, just carry on business as usual. If you, for a moment, and I'm sure all of us here are alarmed by climate change, if for a moment you can think that the governments and the industries who have denied climate change for decades, who have, re who have refused to do anything significant about, about climate change for decades, who haven't even got the courage to tell their own people to take the damn bus, would ever have the integrity or the intelligence to control the planetary thermostat? and do it in a way that would be just and honorable or decent for the poor of the world, for marginalized peoples? Could you ever imagine that would happen? Can you ever conceive for a moment the kind of earth grab they're proposing would ever be of any benefit to Asia or Africa or Latin America? Never. We will not allow that. We in civil society will prevent that. And we're having discussions here today, tomorrow, with all of our partners in Brazil and around the world to say we're going to make a change, we're not going to make this happen, we're not going to let this happen. Thank you very much. the U.S. government that are very proud, supposedly, of what happened in Copenhagen and touting the joys of the Copenhagen Accord, 
what they do know is that it in no way uh, averts climate chaos. And so they are actively pursuing this so-called plan B uh, behind closed doors. And you really see a causal relationship between the political failure to deal with climate change and this acceleration of the embrace of technologies like geoengineering and, and the, these ideas like um, pouring uh, sulfur into the stratosphere in order to dim the sun. Uh, it's a kind of a new dark age that they are trying to, to impose on us. So I think as we look forward to Rio, I think we need to understand the depths of the, ch of the challenge that we face. That, that when we challenge these technologies, we really are challenging the stories at the center of Western culture, what they call, what we call civilization. And in a sense, it's a, it, it precipitates a crisis to challenge these technologies because even though they seem really far out there, you know, synthetic biology, you know, reflecting the sun back to space, fertilizing the oceans, the truth is that they fit perfectly within our current economic, social, and cultural paradigms. This is what we do. We dominate nature. We use our ingenuity to fix any problem. We overcome any limits. We always find a new frontier. So even if we have an initial feeling of, whoa, there's something wrong with that, the only thing that we have to do in order to bring on the reality that Pat has just laid out is nothing. It's just to sort of go limp and let it happen. Because all the momentum of our society is propelling us towards that future. <laughs> Recogiendo las proposiciones del Fórum Social Mundial de, los, de la Inmigración en Quito y las del Fórum de Dakar y de la Carta Mundial de Migrantes que se ha firmado en Goré el 11 de febrero de 2011, exige la ratificación y la aplicación de la Convención de las Naciones Unidas por los Derechos de los Trabajadores Inmigrantes y de sus familiares. La libertad y circulación y el derecho de instalarse donde se decida, el cierre de los centros de detención de inmigrantes y la anulación de todos los acuerdos y los programas que violan los derechos humanos en las fronteras. Denuncia las consecuencias de las políticas de explotación neocolonial y neoliberal y reivindica que los migrantes jugamos un rol fundamental en cuanto a actores sociales y políticos por una ciudadanía universal. L'un des piliers du réseau France Afrique aussi, à ne pas oublier, vous en saurez beaucoup sur lui ce soir en vous déplaçant sur le terrain du basket pour regarder le film. Merci pour votre attention. Je laisse la place à ce groupe qui vient de Venezuela dont je vous ai dit que le titre s'appelle Negro Rituel. It's not a green one or a orange one or whatever. This is a very clear anti-imperialist revolution. That is the way why the Americans and the, uh, uh, the administrations and all the states of the Euro of the European community has reacted at that way. In the, in the beginning they were supporting the regime and after a while they were clear that they have made a double standard policy with Egypt more than 30 years along. Now the Egyptian people is about to make a big hole in the iron wall of imperialism. Now, now and not tomorrow, all progressive forces in the world have, has to be among all of us. All of us have to be behind the Egyptian revolution to achieve these uh, aims.
l'aménagement et de la façon dont nous avons réadapté tout ce qui a pu se passer ici avec les tentes, mais également aussi avec les réflexions. Merci à tout le monde. Oui, un autre monde est possible.